Welcome to Running on Ice, the coolest community in freight. I'm your host, Mary O'Connell, bringing you the latest tech updates, warehouse news, and everything happening in the cold chain world. Not only is there the coolest show in freight, but there's also Running on Ice, the newsletter that could not be colder. You can subscribe to that on freightwaves.com slash running on ice. Today, we are joined by Dr. Cliff Glade and Dr. Robert DiLoretto. Welcome back to the show, gentlemen. How are you doing? Uh, I'm very excited to have you guys back on, mostly because it's always, um, I always learn a lot when you guys come on, and it's one of my favorite things. Um, But today, we're kind of taking a different approach, and this is something that I have seen all over your guys' like marketing and social media and everything like that, so we got to get into it, because if it's coming out from you guys, it's got to be really cool, right? So you guys have had these med shield kits. Do you mind breaking that down and kind of saying what they are and why they're so important and, you know, why you guys have come out with them? The med shield is a case that is both white, lightweight and extremely strong, designed by doctors to carry medical equipment out into the field. In fact, after we did the initial designs, we put it out into the field with paramedic CMS, police departments, and modified the case to meet issues that we ran into in actual usage. By way of example, Working nights, paramedics and EMS have problems with not being able to see the latches, so we made them glow in the dark. Um, We made a backpack so that they could put the uh, med shield on their backs and run out of the truck. We made the upper lid contain a chemical proof uh, set of dividers to hold the equipment that they needed in the field. And the, they told me that other equipment that they had, they would end up throwing out the dividers and the inserts when they got blood on. Imagine that, getting blood out at, a, at an accident scene or with the military. So we made ours uh, resistant so that they can't stain and washable in a regular machine. That input, along with being physicians ourselves, allowed us to design a very specifically custom case to meet the needs. One of the unusual things we did is we actually have a video of taking the case up 75 feet in the air on a ladder truck and throwing it off the ladder truck along with the competitors. In our case, I had put blood transfusions and then later we used those blood transfusions. The other case didn't fare too well. So making it lightweight and stronger and I hesitate to say probably better priced than anything on the market um, was a challenge, but one that we were able to. Personally, I love any sort of like rugged ability or dur- durability testing um, to the point where I think that would be probably the coolest job in the world because you get to fling stuff off a building. Um, you get to like just run it over with a car and just see if you can break it. And to me, that seems really, really fun. So I hope that you guys actually were on the ladder truck, like flinging it off, seeing if it would break because that was fun. You will be impressed. But what was really, it was actually uh, the U.S. military asked for a six-foot drop test. So we brought their staff out on site, and they got a little bit uh, taken back when a ladder truck arrived, and we took it up 75 feet. And the purpose was to allow medical supplies to go to a, a site where you may not be able to land a helicopter. We're not suggesting that they throw it off at 75 feet, but if our guys are in trouble, we wanted it to be able to to take it. That's, I mean, personally, I love that as someone that, you know, hopefully would never need services like that. But at the same time, it's great that, you know, you guys are able to help save those lives and get people the care that they need um, because, you know, it's, it's, you, nobody wants to be bleeding at a place where it's hard to get someone to stop the bleeding. Mary, Mary, to that point, the practicality as well as the rugged ability of it, you know, is very important. And the feedback from the users uh, created the design. And as Cliff mentioned in the under the lid, it's almost like a notebook sideways with part, you know, with the compartments in it that flip uh, like pages. And so 
they were able to, as opposed to other cases, trying to find places for things to go, uh, built this what for what they wanted, meaning, you know, one page would have certain things on it, the next page would have another, and it made things very easy and more usable and practical from them on a, you know, on a life to life and death situation. So it was it was their design, basically, you know, with our product. One of the one of the changes that we had to make from the fire departments is they have a tendency to overstuff equipment. So we had to upgrade the hinges to tolerate the uh, challenge of meeting the way it was used in the field because we give it a 30 year warranty. So do you guys, is it, is it like, is it customizable by like, if I'm a, if I'm one fire department, I can customize it and fire department B can customize it something different or paramedic squad C can do that. Or is it just kind of, there's the set thing, but it's been put through the vetting process by all these different first responders. The inserts are customizable to any extent. You could completely take them out or you could make them 20 different spaces, or you can make them three different spaces. And as I said before, you can throw them in a washing machine and wash any of the debris that got on them in the field. I mean, it's one thing to talk about a case, and it's another thing to actually use it in the field. Uh, Bob and I are doctors. We know what you need in the field. We've been there, we've done it, and we set it up for them. They may do it slightly differently. One fire department may have several crews that jump out of an ambulance. One crew opens an airway. One crew starts fluids going. They may carry two med shields, one with everything for fluids and one with everything for airway, so they're not sharing a case. We ran into all these issues once we started putting it out into the field, and we designed along with them how to make it work for each department, no matter who they were. So one of the things that you guys have really kind of done is, um, or at least I've seen, but I have some questions about, is you guys have this grant program for med shields. Kind of what is that and what made you guys say like, oh, like we're going to help out other um, first responders and medical people get, get these cases into their hands? The grant program was to support our frontline responders. Um, what we did is we're going to be awarding multiple winners up to $5,000 worth of TCP products, including PCMs, which will be refrigerated, frozen, or ultra code, depending on what their needs are, our insulated totes to carry medicines at the proper temperatures, and the med shields, depending what that particular grant uh, agency needs. All they have to do is be a registered first responder organization, such as a fire department, EMS, law enforcement, sports medicine professionals, and the agency has to apply for the grant, not an individual person. That's kind of cool. I like that you guys have done that. A straight donate. There are no strings attached. I like it. And uh, I guess the I've, I guess uh, the application and everything is on your guys' website if someone were to go look for it. Yes. Um, our IT department put the application. It's a very simple application. We may come back and ask additional questions, but we're only looking to make sure that the equipment goes to the people who need it the most. Um, so one of the, you, one of the things that you mentioned that was part of that grant is the phase changes. And these are something that we guys, that we talked about last, last time. Um, so I guess when it comes to some of these emergency situations and these EMS, um, first responder ones, those phase change things that, you know, keep things at certain temperatures, um, how, what kind of application do those have like in the field? Because typically when you think about first responders, you think of, um, you know, like your ambulance that's going to go, like you said provide airways or maybe stop bleeding, set bones after a car crash. There's not always that um, that need to keep things uh, either ultra cold or, you know, refrigerated. So where does that application come in? The applications we generally see are for the pharmaceuticals. Uh, to, many have to be kept uh, refrigerated. Some have to be kept frozen or what we refer to as ultra cold. The alternatives are using wet ice or dry ice. The problems with dry ice is that it has to be procured and available, and it also can be dangerous to the people in the truck. Uh, the problems with wet ice is I'm not sure how you sterilize it. So 
what we develop for extremely large healthcare, our clients are the largest healthcare in the United States, um, is a HDPE food grade outer hard plastic with the phase change material inside at the temperature that they need. Most of the time that's refrigerated. Sometimes it's, it, it's frozen, probably 70% refrigerated, 30% frozen. Vaccines might have to be ultra cold. DNA, RNA for law enforcement might have to be ultra cold. It, it, the evidence is only as good as how you maintain it. If it comes contaminated or you lose a chain of custody or you um, don't keep it at the proper temperature, it degradates, worthless. The whole case goes out. I think that uh, especially when you talk about that evidence and that chain of custody thing, that's, I mean, that's really important and crucial because if, like you said, if something happens or that sample degrades, then that's potentially, you know, long-term legal ramifications or, you know, potentially someone who committed crimes can't get put away um, for their crimes that they've done because the DNA got messed up. So, um, you know, lo love that application. It seems pretty straightforward. Well, I mean, think of urine samples, semen samples, DNA samples. If it's if it's not protected and handled properly, an attorney is going to attack that and maybe some very evil people get back out onto the street. Not because they didn't do it, because there's a loss of chain of custody or the sample that was taken was destroyed due to temperature. And that's that's not only the, the the contamination DNA stuff that Cliff was just talking about, <clears throat> Mary, but from a medication standpoint, um, too cold or not cold enough or frozen uh, at at a pre-described period of time can ruin all of those things and then potentially call, cause deleterious effects on whoever's receiving that. Um, example was the the amount of of COVID vaccines that were lost, not lost physically, lost because of poor storage and you know and transport, which were obviously hugely expensive, plus the lack of the you know lack of the vaccines. <clears throat> that applies to the the biologics, the chemotherapeutic agents, all these immunotherapy agents. It's it's this it's exactly the same thing. Interestingly enough, and we're not involved in this, but I did as a practicing physician uh, do a fair number of organ transplants. <clears throat> and as a, as a urologist, that happened to be kidneys primarily. And what they would do with the kidneys is put them in a, in a sterile bag to be transported to wherever the, do the recipient, from the donor site to the recipient site, and then put that sterile bag in a, as Cliff said, just a standard ice solution, um, you know, hoping the bag didn't break, you know, and, and then contaminate the, you know, contaminate the organ. Uh, that's another potential application for us, but we, we have not gotten into that market. But it's, you know, it, it's applicable across the whole spectrum of, of medicine and emergency medicine and sports medicine and, you know, and, every, and everything else. And we're just trying to solve some problems for everybody. Yeah, that's something that we've chatted about a couple times on the show is, you know, with the increase in, um, you know, customization of people's healthcare. like there's certain therapeutics that, you know, they can take, uh, I don't know if it's like a cancer cell or something where they can take it and then customize it and then they ship it back to you, but it has to be kept at a certain temperature. And then it's kind of, um, there's certain therapies and everything like that, that are doing that. So I feel like, especially with the rise of that type of medicine happening and those type of solutions, it's going to the keeping things at a very specific temperature to make sure that they stay and cannot variate and it has to be ultra cold. I think that that's only going to continue to be a huge problem in the supply chain. Just a single one of our clients has us, uses our equipment to move 300,000 specimens every morning. Just a single one of our clients. And over the years we've been doing it, we have never lost a specimen. And even more importantly, we design our equipment to go 24 hours. And I can't tell you how many times they have left it in a vehicle for a weekend and everything is still good. We don't promise it to them, but it's still good. So they don't get to call the patient and say, hey, do you remember that liver biopsy I took? Can you come in so I could do it again? Because I don't think the average person wants to hear that. 
So when it comes to like the future of these phase change materials, um, do you ever foresee a like do you ever foresee a med shield kit and a phase change crossover? Like you have a med shield kit that's able to keep things cold or um, do you think they'll kind of stay separate and kind of what does the future of both of those things look like as we kind of head into the new year here? We have designed for several hospitals, uh, med shields with the ability to hold whole blood. It would be type O for a universal uh, donor. Um, these are people that are going to bad scenes. We have designed it for the military. You've heard of the golden hour. You know that the difference between life, death, and permanent injury sometime is A, who's helping you, and B, how quickly you can get help. So if we have an injured soldier in the field and we can get him blood sooner rather than later before he's at the field hospital, it can make a major change in his life. And Bob can speak to that. Mary, to, to that point, um, you know, there's obviously, and in, in the reason I'm sure you asked it, that, you know, the practicality of having one kit versus multiple kits. But to Cliff's point, uh, these major traumas uh, and, and the life-saving capabilities of the staff involves huge volumes of transfusions. Um, you know, it isn't just a one bag or two bags of you know blood. It's like ten or fifteen bags or more, you know or more, uh, particularly with a lot of the military injuries. And so the practicality of of having a combo kit, you know, is very impractical because everything you need to do uh, from a medical standpoint for access and and infusions and stuff and and first responder kits, you know, is in one or two of the med shield kits and then the blood or, or whatever other substances that they're using uh, in volume are in one of the tote, uh, tote kits. Um, and I think that combo is probably a more advantageous way of dealing with it than trying to make a, you know, a, a onesie, to, you know, one, one stop to fit it, you know, to fit everything. I mean, I guess when you put it that way, you do need a kind of a entire mobile emergency room in a box. So you're going to need just more than a few things to uh, get people stitched up and fixed up and stable enough that they can be transported to the actual hospital with um, the entire hospital's worth of medical supplies. But yeah, I guess when you put it that way, it's kind of hard to put all of that in one case unless you're walking around with like a Rubbermaid tote of uh something but then that's not very practical to be able to hop out of an ambulance and lug a tote across the field so yeah that that, that makes sense that it will kind of always stay as two separate units some time ago we were asked to provide a case to a person who is extremely high up in this government that travels with him with his blood and um i delivered it to Washington and showed up there with a case with wires and uh, data at loggers, which caused a major problem walking into this secure facility. Um, but I can only say that this person travels with our. I am sure that that was not at all a very long questioning about what is this, who is this for, and why do you have it? Um, because I feel like I feel like that's just that's just signing yourself up for a couple for a couple hours of questioning. All right, nothing like walking in that particular building with wires that look like a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, we're just here to save lives, not the other way around. And, and solid gel filled packs with uh, that. Uh, is a C4 explosive or something, you know, <laughs> what's it? Well, to, to make things worse, I trained some of the bomb dogs. Oh, no. so I have C4 on my hands all the time and I can't go through the, the little puffer machines. I set them off. But luckily <laughs> I carry a card. I call this number as the young men are holding guns on me and they <laughs> uh, tell them, yes, that's clear. Uh, please don't kill him. <laughs> just just another Tuesday for you.
<laughs> All right. So that being said, um, we uh, we have easier questions for you to handle other than, um, you know, why are you bringing this random wire device into a, a building? Um, so the we already know where you guys stand on dad jokes and cereal as a soup. So this time, if you can only have one color of food for the rest of your life, what color would it be? Dr. Cliff, why don't you start us off? Red, because I'm an adventurous, outgoing guy. <laughs> okay. Bob would probably pick blue because he lives below minus 50 degrees. No, no, I'm, I'm going to pick red because I'm Italian and that's the right pasta sauce color. <laughs> so, so it's both red. Well, I mean, I guess you technically could have pasta if it's all wrapped up in red because it's you're still eating red. But then I, I actually have one back for you. You, you, you since it's Christmas time, and, and we went through the dad jokes one. I just got one from one of my nine grandkids. Why, what What did the elf say when Santa got stuck in the chimney? What did they call him? They call what they call him. I was going to say, oh, no, but. No, they, he was claustrophobic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I really like that one. I like that one. That's what happens when you have nine grandkids. I mean, you got to have jokes for days with that kind of, uh, with that kind of entourage. So gentlemen, if anyone has questions about the grant, um, if they have some dad jokes for you, or um, if they have any, you know, questions about the med shield kits or your face change materials, where can they guys find you outside the show? They can go to the website, www.thermalcustompackaging.com. And that'll have all of our products. Or they can write me at C, as in Charlie, Glade, at thermalcustompackaging.com. So, yeah, similarly, uh, uh, TCP for me, and then the, you know, Robert, uh, or DiLoretto at Vextra that you have listed already. Awesome. Well, you guys heard it here first. Uh, their DMs are open for your best dad jokes. Um, <laughs> but thank you guys so much for joining us today. Thank you, Mary. You have a wonderful day. You can catch other episodes of Running on Ice right here on YouTube or anywhere else you get your podcasts like Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Need more Running on Ice news? No sweat. Subscribe to the newsletter on FreightWaves.com slash Running on Ice. See you on the internet.